Hi, everybody. I'm here with my good friend all the way from Los Angeles, where the Dodgers play and where the Anaheim Angels play with their newly acquired starting pitcher, Zach Grinke, which we will not be talking about, but I'm just saying it to rub it in. because Oh, Dodgers. that happened this morning. I didn't see that. I, no, actually, Grinke got traded. Uh, we're recording this on Monday. He got traded Friday, and he started for the Angels last night. Oh, oh that's right. That's right. Yeah, because the, the deadline is tomorrow afternoon. Yep. Although the Dodgers did get Hanley Ramirez, and he is playing well in his first few games, so yeah, he's huh? doing he's off to a good start. I watched the game last night. People will hate this. I watched the game last night. It was uh, Clayton Kershaw versus Ryan Vogel's song, and it was a good game. And the Giants lost, so yeah, you must they, be you must be happy. Yeah, Cl- Cl- Kershaw. Well, they swept. Yes, the giant. They swept the Giants, which was payback for them being swept by the Giants up there about a month ago. Keep your eye out on the Diamondbacks. And you can yeah, hear they're, the, they're they're bringing it. They're they're they've won like what nine out of twelve or something. So, and we're starting early, folks, with the sirens. Those hey. are on th- those are on my end, not Greg's end. Yeah, I don't I don't have the sirens yet. There's not too many here. That that that's over at the Kill Radio Studio. I, I live in a nicer neighborhood, sort of. Those are actually that's the fire department. Uh, there's a station about three blocks from here. Not those weren't ambulances. So somebody's house is burning. Or a cat is stuck in a tree here in Halifax. And that's your sports and news. The weather is cool, breezy, and sunny here in Halifax. So we're up to date. That's sort of CNN as done from my bedroom. So we're here with Greg in my recording studio slash bedroom today to talk about dum 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 Falcon. Because Greg, the author of Project Data, a uh, old friend of Bill Moore and expert not expert we won't say expert but knowledgeable about the whole aviary mj12 all that stuff that was cooking in the 80s and early 90s that people still talk about 20 years later for reasons that elude me but i thought well people might be interested to hear what greg has to say then i realized he'd been on a couple of other shows before but then i realized what those shows were so i thought i'd bring him onto this show and just let him talk without interrupt being interrupted by survivalist commercials so that's what i'm going to do i'm just going to let him talk i'm not going to talk the whole time paul I, i'm warning you now i'm going to make you talk <laughs> that sounds it sounds like the gestapo i'm warning you i'm, <laughs> I'm going, going to make, to you, make talk. you talk you will talk i don't have anything to say or you will by the time we are done <laughs> you will have plenty to say in about an hour Hogan. <laughs> Anywho, so, well, okay, I will talk, of course, but as anyone who knows me knows that that's going to happen. But I won't be advertising for survivalist gear. I know you think it's not important, and I sort of agree with you, but it was just a little piece of history that had to sort of be gotten out of the way, and I wanted to do it now. Oh, no, it's not that I don't think it's important, but it's interesting. And as a, his, a historian before I was anything else, you know, you realize that you don't have to uh, be the most important thing. There are these little tidbits in the history of anything that can be interesting. And sure, it's a it's a loose knot in the UFO subculture subject, shall we say, that has never quite been fully tied. That's a horrible metaphor, but it's the one I could think <laughs> of. So I'm going to let you tie the knot. Falcon, explain who Falcon was. Explain what the background of all this was for people who are listening who might not know about it. And then tell us... Because you've been telling me for years, oh, one of these days I'm going to tell people. So now you've told people who you think Falcon is. Take us through that story, and then I'll ask questions. Okay. God, how do I start for people? I, I would suspect that most of your listening audience is fairly up on a lot of this stuff, so I, will, I won't go like you know into horrible detail. But um, the reason that, uh, at least to some people, this Falcon thing was important is that it's sort of a linchpin a lot of a lot of the uh, UFO government stuff dating from the 1980s probably into maybe the early 90s who this guy was was um, as far as I can tell uh, somebody that was running a counterintelligence operation against the Soviet Union this was it started during the Reagan years and continued throughout the Reagan years and a little bit into the uh, the Bush one presidency so at this point, there was still a Cold War on. Reagan was president when this started. So, you know, you remember he called the uh, Soviet Union the Great Satan or something. I can't remember. Evil Empire. So what was going on at this time was they were trying to figure out how many Soviet spies there were in the United States, what they were looking at, um, who they were interested in. And on the other side of that coin, agents we had in the Soviet Union posing as Soviet citizens or whatever 
we're vacuuming up information there and sending it back. There is a whole big network of information passing back and forth uh, through spy networks. What a lot of people didn't know at the time, and probably most people know now, is that the spies were quite interested in UFO researchers because UFO researchers are interested in weird stuff flying in the sky. Sometimes weird stuff flying in the sky is not unknown. It's something that is known by somebody and it tends to be, you know, um, advanced aircraft, black projects, other things that may be going on, you know, beams directed into the sky, rockets, things like that. And if UFO researchers are getting reports from people that say, what's this weird light that was flying over so-and-so, they can figure out, well, it was over this military base, it was probably this thing. And the Russians knew that, too. So they would contact UFO researchers and see if they could get a little bit of information off them just by saying, I am Russian UFO researcher. I would really like to know what you know about this UFO. And they would tell them, and occasionally they would get some nice information about something doing some weird, you know, something weird in the air that was near a military base. They could make a reasonable assumption that it had something to do with United States defense, especially if they could cross-reference it with other, other information they were getting. So in light of this... This guy Falcon, as he was known, and I will get into that a little bit too. Paul, you don't have to say anything for like 20 minutes. Yeah, uh, sorry, we just have to take a commercial break now, Greg. We'll be right back with more about this crazy Falcon guy. We'll yeah. probably be talking about Donald Kehoe too, because I'm sure he fits in here somewhere. <laughs> the over/under under Kehoe or for Kehoe. Anyway, so yes, continue on. I'm enjoy I'm enjoying this because I actually haven't heard you sort of nonstop give the story yet and then we'll get into you know I'll, i'm writing questions down so we'll follow up but continue on sir you're writing them down now you didn't write them down before the interview we were talking about this with the entire we had a pre-conversation folks about art bell and george and Ori and how they send questions out to their guests or no they have their quest uh, their guests write their own questions and then they basically just ask them the difference between bell and nori is bell would follow up he'd, he'd get an answer and then off he'd go whereas nori just kind of keeps reading the questions which is fine so that's what we're going to do here Only next I question yeah <laughs> except i'm letting i'm letting greg just basically create the questions as he goes along so then i'm writing them down and then we'll follow that's up. that's fine you know that's what art bell did probably you know where you're doing it or just did it in his mind and he was a great radio person so anyway uh you're following in in, in large footsteps what they realized like i said was that uh, ufo researchers occasionally stumbled onto some things having to do with advanced uh, aircraft technology or other sort of technology you would see in the sky so they figured well let's reach out to the ufo research people and this was in the late 70s which is uh, another fact there's no internet or anything like that just telephone and mail regular hand delivered us mail in this country so they, uh, somebody in the government, particularly this Falcon character, who was a retired CIA person, OSS person, I will explain a little bit of that later, his history, and was brought out of retirement to do this, thought, well, let's, or somebody told him, let's get in touch with some UFO researcher types who know what's going on and ask if they will help us out by, you know, passing information along to us and letting us know what people are talking about you know, what they're looking at, what's being discussed, because they couldn't just go online and find this out. They, they had to, you know, they had to get somebody who was hooked into that network of people who would send letters and would talk on the phone. So what apparently happened was they, they sent out, uh, they had a little fishing expedition by sending out uh, spurious UFO reports from the military out to a few UFO organizations. Uh, one of these letters ended up in the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, APRO, which people can look up, of which Bill Moore was a uh, board member. He investigated and found out the thing was basically, he actually found the person that made the report, and the guy said, yeah, that's me, that's what I saw, but there's a lot of stuff added on there that didn't happen. So Bill figured, okay, what the hell, I mean, there's nothing really we can do with this, and he dropped it. But then somebody found out that he actually did check up on it, which, you know, either the other organizations either didn't check up on it or they swallowed it hook, line, and sinker and just said, you know, isn't this great? It's a report from the military, you know, some guy go, trying to go around the military and say what he saw and get this information out. Bill actually went and checked up on it and called the guy. He actually talked to him. So noticing this, they approached uh, Moore and said, would you be interested in doing this? What I said, you know, gathering information, talk, telling what people were talking about to make sure that there weren't, you know, leaks in security inadvertent now obviously because it was just ufo researchers they didn't care about strange aircraft or anything like that they should but they didn't 
So what they offered him was uh, a deal because he can't just say, can you give us this information, you know, as a good, a good citizen or something like that. They said, we will give you UFO information from government files that nobody else has ever seen. However, not all of it's going to be straight. Some of it will be fake. Some of it will be useless. And that's not our problem. You, you know, you'll have to figure that out on your own. But you will be given access to stuff that nobody else has been given access to. So Bill said, yeah, sure, okay. Uh, he lived sort of to regret what was going on, as he told me. Uh, but he did cooperate and basically reported on people. And then in a couple cases, passed information to people he, he knew that was um, fake or partially fake because somebody told him to do it, specifically to uh, Paul Benowitz, who's the subject of my book, warning him that he should not be too serious about it, and he wasn't. And two, I believe, a guy named Lee Graham, because they apparently they thought he was a security risk, and they wanted to see how much of a security risk he was by pumping him full of what he thought was secret information and seeing what he did with it. As things progressed... Bill found out about uh, people in the government he was introduced to or found out or they got in contact with him. I don't know which. People who are currently or formerly in the government employ, usually in intelligence agencies like the CIA, NSA, Defense Intelligence Agency, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, that were interested in the UFO subject and were trying to find out what the, you know, what the government knew about UFOs from their point of view, from, you know, I used to know, you know, such as, I used to work in the CIA, I know people in the CIA, I'm interested in the UFO subject, what can I get out of my friends in the CIA about the UFO subject to help me learn more personally about this? That They all were interested in what the government knew, and they thought they could get to it by using the government connections. Bill fell in with this group of people, and in order to be able to talk about this on the phone or in, you know, at a restaurant or something like that, him and his research partner, Jamie Chandray, came up with a system to refer to these different people in this group, this loosely associated, loosely knit group, and uh, assigned them names of birds, which as a group of birds, they were called the aviary. And um, this was never an official group. It was put to, you know, it was a bunch of people with a mutual interest. All this stuff I'm saying here is what I believe to be true and, you know, could be changed and amended by uh, new information. But this is as I know it now. So they referred to pe these people by bird names. And at the top of it, you know, the top of the food chain or whatever was somebody called the falcon. Because falcons are, you know, smaller and faster than hawks and whatever. But, the, you know, there was a seagull, there was a blue jay, there was a chickadee, there was a penguin, there was a, all these different people. And uh, Falcon was at the top of this. He was one sort of running the operation on the government side. And he, you know, the, some of these people in the aviary may have been involved in some of this uh, UFO researcher business. And some of them might not have. I, I, I tend to think most of them weren't, except for the couple other people that actually were UFO researchers. Uh, one of them that I know of. And for... It, it, he, he uh, Bill Moore and to some extent Jamie Chandray took assignments from this guy Falcon and and said you're going to get some letters from Russia. They have certain you know they have text on them. A guy's going to call you up at a certain time. You read what's on the letter, punctuation and all, and that's it. You hang up. That was one of the things he had to do. The other thing you know they they had a guy that was passing information to the Russians. He apparently hung out in the gay community in the. In Los Angeles, and Bill had to go through gay bars looking for the guy. That was another one of his assignments. At least that's what he told me. But you know, he did various things. He basically was trained to, a la Chuck Barris, if you've seen that sort of, to be a to be a uh, an asset in exchange for this UFO information. And he did indeed get some UFO information that uh, from the government that nobody else knew about. Now, he's of the opinion at this point that most of it was either fake or useless. At the time, he thought a majority of it was up in the air, but some of it might be useful. As it turned out, not too much was useful, ultimately, and he probably got the short end of the deal. Um, in addition to having his, uh, having his reputation be smirched in the UFO community for what he did. But in 2001 or two, I think, I was assigned to write a book about this guy, Paul Benowitz, and... Bill Moore's uh, involvement with him and the government. That book was called Project Beta. And in the course of doing this book, I found out all this information I'm telling you about now. 
The one thing I couldn't find out was the actual identity of the person known as Falcon. So I kept asking Bill, you know, are you going to tell me who he is? Ah, I don't know. I don't think I should. Then after the book was finished, sent to the printer and, you know, waiting to come out, I was working on another book called Weird California. And um, strangely enough, Bill Moore knew about a lot of weird places in Southern California because he rode his motorcycle a lot and he knew about all these you know strange places and he liked going there. So he, you know a couple of the things that he showed me and told me about ended up in that book Weird California. One of them was this place in Rustic Canyon where there was an actual Nazi training camp for a while till they got caught um, by the FBI and shut down. But the ruins are there in Rustic Canyon, which is about halfway to Malibu, up the coast from Santa Monica. You just go up one of the, the uh, coastal canyons there, a place called Rustic Canyon. The place is just choked with weeds and overgrowth, but there's little roads and buildings and everything all through this little canyon, all just completely abandoned, covered with graffiti. There's old barns there, and you know, uh, there's underground passageways I found. Oh, it's a really weird place. So Bill told me about this. He goes, you know about Rustic Canyon? I've heard of it. Well, let's go out there and, and hike around, and we'll uh, take a look. So we drove out there one day, and as we're out there, oh, I'm sorry. Before that, he asked if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted to know who Falcon was, I could guess. Paul has problems with this. He says, if he was your friend, why didn't he just tell you? I think he might have felt like he was under some pressure not to say anything about it or not to reveal it directly. So a lot of these um, intelligence people I've talked to. If they want to help you, hint after hint after hint, and then if you guess it, they can say, yeah, you're right, and then they haven't uh, violated their whatever oath they have to not tell you directly what something is. But if they think it's valuable enough that you know this, they'll, they'll help you out. And it, that, I countered that over and over again. So what I figured was Bill is doing the same thing with me. So over the course of like a year after the book was published, he gave me hints, I mean, uh, delivered to the publisher, he gave me hint after hint, and basically what it boiled down to was the guy who used to be in the OSS, which was a predecessor to the CIA, the Office of Strategic Services, which began in World War II and was basically the, the um, wartime intelligence arm of the U.S. military and was involved in um, getting as many, uh, it was getting as many uh, Nazi intelligence people over to our side after the war, just like the paperclip people were involved in getting rocket scientists and all that. He was in the OSS uh, when the CIA started. He, he worked his way through becoming station chief in base, uh, various places like, uh, I believe, Afghanistan and uh, another another place in the Middle East somewhere. I can't remember all of his station chief duties, but he ended up being basically the, the Soviet, the, their Soviet expert up to about, I think, 1971 when he retired. So Bill told me that. He also told me the guy had died already as of 2000 because this was 2005. And he told me that he was of uh, Eastern European extraction. So what I did was I, just, I started going through libraries, publications, basically open source stuff, trying to find this guy's name. I couldn't find anybody with an Eastern European kind of name. So I was thinking, well, maybe he just said that because one of his parents was Eastern European or something like that. So I started I started making guesses. Uh, Richard Helms. Uh, Cord Meyer, uh, who else? James Jesus Angleton, people like that. I mean, people I knew that were in the OSS, had been in the CIA, and did know quite a bit about the Soviet thing. And Angleton would certainly fit in with that. Bill just kept saying, no, 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 cold, cold warmer, warmer, you know, stuff like that. In the list of 20 or 30 or 40 people I had, this guy's name was on there. I just hadn't presented it to Bill yet. So to get back to the Rustic Canyon episode, um, I think, you know, he didn't say anything to me that day till we got there. We get, we go and we go start hiking and we stop to have a rest near one of these ruins. And he said, well, okay, I'll, you've guessed, you've guessed so many things. You've gotten really close a few times. So I'll just tell you who it is. And he said, the guy's name was Harry Rositsky. And that's all he said. And then he spelled it out for me. And then we spent the, you know, the next eight hours hiking around this canyon. And so for like an hour and a half, I'm like sticking the, I'm trying to remember this guy's name. So when we get, I don't have anything to write with. So when we get back, I can start looking it up. So Bill told me who the guy was. I immediately started doing in, uh, some research on him, got one of his books online. I mean, I, I ordered one of his books from um, a used book dealer called The CIA's, the CIA's uh, Secret Operations, I believe it was called. It was written in 1978, I think. 
uh, when he was supposedly in retirement. So I found out that you know, his parents were from Poland, Eastern Europe. He was born in New York City, in Brooklyn, actually. Educated in area colleges in New York and got a graduate degree in German language, actually. Old German languages from uh, Harvard. He was good at keeping uh, information uh, secret, good at compartmenting stuff that means you know making sure only certain people know certain things good at running double agents good at uh, running uh, secret agents into you know other countries and he retired you know with a, with a you know distinguished record and uh, in 1971 and then sometime in the late 70s he was called out of retirement because Richard Helms who was a former CIA director in the late 70s or early 70s under Nixon uh, actually, he was called out of retirement somehow to become to run this uh, operation, getting in, you know more information about the Russians and their spy networks. And Rositsky was good at this. He'd worked with Helms. They knew each other. I mean, it's just you know a bunch of old guys getting together to do what they like to do and did best. So they formed these networks of CIA and CIA asset, asset people like Bill Moore to gather information on uh, uh, Soviet spies. This is you know what people that are in the UFO community forget is that this was what was important to these people was the the spy stuff. They didn't care about the UFO stuff. That was just a, just a tool they used to get the information that they wanted. They didn't care what the UFO community thought or did with the information. Grant Cameron, who's a pretty good researcher and has written a really good essay about this since my Rositsky uh, talk about a month ago, uh, what he thinks is that Yes, it was part of a big, you know, uh, spy operation. I will accept that. But what he also says is that it was also part of the government cover-up of the UFO subject, which I tend not to agree with. He thinks they're covering up the, the fact that there's aliens here from other planets. What I think they're covering up is their their ignorance of where these things are from, but uh, an acknowledgement of, yes, there's something weird going on with something that isn't human, and that's about all they know. But, yeah, if somebody wants to read a really good analysis of the whole arc of the story from, you know, the beginning of Bill Moore being uh, recruited up to me talking about Harry Rositsky. They should read uh, Grant Cameron's essay on his site, Presidential UFO. I don't agree with Grant on a lot of stuff, but damn, he's a good researcher. So, And he remembers everything. It's amazing. Do you have any questions yet? Yeah, sure. Well, let's go back in time briefly. I think most people who would be listening would know Bill Moore is a UFO researcher, author of the, co-author of the Roswell Incident. Yeah. You know, intimately linked with Stan Friedman and MJ-12 and all of that. But let me ask you, how did you meet Bill Moore? Where, where did you kind of enter into the sort of Bill Moore universe and become a satellite? In 1987 or 8, I think it was 87, I was working in Hollywood for a um, stock film business. It was run by a friend of mine. We had a we actually had a, a uh, office. His office was on the uh, corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Cahuenga. One block down at Hollywood Boulevard, I mean, at uh, Cahuenga and Selma Street, was a building where Bill Moore had his office. I had a friend that wanted to make documentaries, so we thought, well, well why don't we just go out and sh We found out that Bill Moore, Stan Friedman, D uh, Bud Hopkins were all going to be talking at this um, conference in Los Angeles sometime in 87. And I, so I approached you know, Bud Hopkins, Stan Friedman, and Bill Moore and said, would you, you know, I, I had just gotten back into the UFO thing after like, you know, maybe 10 years of not really caring about it because I was growing up and in college and all that, and, you know. Girls and drugs and adventure were a lot more interesting than UFOs at that point. But I had gotten back into it, and I looked up Bill Moore, and I found out that his office was a block from where I was. So I just walked, I, I called him up, and I said, hey, I'm a block from you. And I told him my name and what I wanted to do, and he said, sure, come on down. And I got there, and Stan Friedman's in the office with him for some reason. It was, it was, it was weird. It's, I saw Stan Friedman, so I actually had him sign a contract for the video at the same time. But that's how I met Bill. And two years later, he was making a speech in Las Vegas t talking about how he'd cooperated with the government and people were yelling at him and throwing things and getting really upset. But in the course of this, I mean, I, you know, I kept asking these very probing and how the hell do you know this and 
you know, how can you be so sure questions of Bill Moore, instead of just accepting everything he said, and I think I gained a, a slight bit of respect from him at that point. Because, you know, I wouldn't believe everything he said. I just thought, this is very interesting, Bill, you know, can you tell me a little bit more, or, you know. And that's how the relationship developed. I remember I went to lunch with him very early on, and I was very candid about asking him very probing and not comfortable questions. And I think he liked that. So anyway, that, that's how our, that's how we started off. And over the course of the next, you know, what, 15 years or more, we became friends. And by the time I wrote Project Beta, we were close enough friends that, you know, when we got together, we wouldn't really talk about UFOs all that much. That would just be part of our conversation. We hung out and did stuff and went on little road trips. And, you know, we, we actually became friends. I mean, that, that's how it worked out. So that, that's how I met and got to know Bill Moore. And when people ask, how can you trust him? I trust him as much as I trust anybody else that, who I haven't found have, li have lied to me yet. If I find a friend has lied to me, you know, deliberately, then they don't become much of a friend anymore, right? And I never found Bill doing that to me. So dupe or not, I, I never found out him knowingly or at all actually deceiving me in any way. He would tell me what he could, and if he couldn't, he said, well, I... Don't guess. I can't tell you that I'm, I, uh, I'm still working on it, or I've been told not to, or whatever. And I asked him a lot of questions. A lot of things never got made public that I asked him, and he gave me answers to, because I figured it was, you know, it was best to keep it quiet until I found out later if those things were true. And some of the time I did. The 80s and 90s were an interesting time for sort of the subculture that is ufology, and Moore was right there in the middle of it during the 80s, at least and his, his impact has lingered on. So if you're interested in that subject, Moore is an interesting guy. I think if you're just interesting in, interested in sort of weird people in American cultural history, Moore is an interesting guy because that was an interesting time. But let, let me ask you a question. You say he never lied to you, which of course you might or might not know whether he well, did or that not. Well, that, that I know of. Right. But, and this will be the only pointed question and then we'll go back and we'll talk about the Giants and the Dodgers. But <laughs> if... You know, no, I he, want you to ask pointed questions. If you know he lied to other people, and I think if you just look at the Paul Benowitz case, it should be fairly clear that he did, then doesn't that make you pause? Can't we then say that Bill Moore is a liar, a proven liar, and doesn't that then make you pause and think, well, maybe he's also lying to me. I just didn't figure it out because I like the guy. And that's not a... It's not a criticism of you, because I think all of us, at one point or another, usually by women, have been duped. <laughs> so, you know, the people who have become good practice liars can fool people. And yeah. so, do you... I want, It sounds like an interrogation. Do you admit? Do you admit, Hogan? Paul, of course I do. Of course I admit that I could have been lied to, but I haven't had any reason to see that yet so I'm going to continue rightly or wrongly to think that he hasn't lied to me now I will I, I will say that to prove that and to prove that I don't just take things blindly I did make this announcement about Falcon saying he was Harry Rosicki and the only source of my information for that was Bill Moore who told me he had figured it out through various hints he had gotten from other people in the same way I was trying to do it and at the end of the talk I said look this is what I've been told. This is who told me. And, you know, subtext was, I know nobody trusts him, really. Would somebody else, if they could, please try and find out if this theory holds any water? Somebody that has the time, the, the, the access to information, the resources that I don't. I would, you know, I don't, I'm not saying I'm right. And I'm, you know, and, you know, and the subtext of that is Bill could have lied to me. I would like somebody else to, you know, somebody in the government, maybe they can come to me without telling anybody else and say, you know, that was full of crap and here's why. Or, yeah, that's absolutely true. I, you know, I put it out there as a as a theory. I didn't put it out there as, as truth because I don't know. I don't know for 100 percent that Bill told me the truth about this. I am willing to accept it for now until I find out differently. That's how I go about things. I mean, I'm going to as long as you've been straight with me in the past, I'm going to trust you until I have some doubt. And yes, there could be some doubt. Sure, sure he could have lied to me, of course. But I haven't found it yet, so I'm going to continue along my merry way, rightly or wrongly, believing that he was basically truthful with me. And the other part of it is, you know, 
everybody else I've ever had a relationship with in my life, if I get to the point where I'm hanging out with them, going out to lunch, going out and doing different stuff, taking little road trips with them, cracking jokes, sharing, you know, sharing secrets, all that, what, what friends do, and then find out that they're lying to me, yeah, that's a horrible thing, but then you just don't deal with that person anymore. I'm treating Bill the same way I would treat anybody else I know that's a friend of mine. Until I find out they're deceiving me, they're still my friend, and as far as I know, they're telling me the truth. This is why Greg and I are still friends, because he, he hasn't figured out yet. <laughs> he hasn't figured out any of your lies yet, no. Yes, my clever lies about my career as a great film producer. Let me ask you about UFO cover-up live. Yes. Which introduced their sources, Falcon and Condor. Now, yeah. and which people, anybody who knows the sort of UFO subculture, routinely... UFO cover up live is, you know, they bring it out as a punchline at, when you're having drinks at the end of a long day at a UFO conference. Because, you know, the aliens apparently said, oh, you know, we love strawberry ice cream and Tibetan music. Which, frankly, I have to tell you, if I'm an alien and I come here, I might like strawberry ice cream and Tibetan music. Yes, why not? What are, what are they going to say? You know, what, like, What's I, the go to weird spiritual thing that not too many people know about? Tibet. So, Tibetan music. What the well, hell? Well, maybe not. I mean, if it's Nick Redfern's, you know, they might say, I like chocolate ice cream and the Ramones. Yes. But, you know, the, the real aliens, the EBs, like strawberry ice cream and Tibetan music. And I, I, I don't like strawberry ice cream, but I like Tibetan music, so I'm half alien. That's yeah. what we're going to learn here, folks. Our takeaway is Paul Kimball, half alien. So, anyway, they're doing. What the hell is that? What, that loud sound? That's <laughs> they're taking me back to the mothership. But the transportation <laughs> They're vacuuming you up into the mothership. <laughs> exactly. I'm being vacuumed up into the mothership. That would be great in a science fiction movie. Somebody's getting beamed up and instead of like a beaming up noise, you hear a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, it's like the Linda Cortiel abduction, only not as sophisticated. It's like Travis Walton. I'm being vacuumed up. You can hear it all throughout the forest. I, I, you know what? I was going to say we'll stop, but frankly, I'm just, folks, this is alien sounds that you're hearing. Or my neighbor's mowing his lawn. Choose whichever one you wish to believe, but I'm just going to keep rolling. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd be vacuumed up by aliens. <laughs> ah, this help me! This isn't Paul talking anymore. This is an alien imposter. Yes, that is right. It is an alien imposter known as Zorgrat. Yeah. That, see, Zorgrat comes... He uses a vacuum. It's a long story. Um, I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. So UFO cover up live. I just eight. I don't want to hear about. It. No, probably not. Falcon and Condor. First of all, do you know who Condor was? Uh, apparently, he was Robert Collins, who was a, a Air Force um, colonel, I think, at the time. Right. Uh, I don't know if he was involved in the uh, OSI, Office of Special Investigations. He may have been involved in it. Uh, you know, this is something people could look up. Involved in uh, Air Force Intelligence, which is a, d a different branch. Here's the interesting thing on UFO Cover Up Live, among all the, which was hosted by Mike Farrell of MASH. Very odd. Yes. Moore and Chandra, and I want to come back to Chandra in a second, but they introduced a whole bunch of sources and stuff, including Falcon. So, was Falcon actually on UFO Cover Up Live? Not as far as I know, but he was there watching it. Because he was the one, I think, that orchestrated putting the thing together. So in fact, there were people from the intelligence community that were scaring the crap out of the producer, Michael Seligman, by telling him that this was very important, that he was dealing, dealing with national security, and that uh, and he thought it was in relationship to UFOs. He had no idea it had anything to do with anything else. So, yeah, Fal Falcon Rosicki was there, according to Moore. I'm trying to figure out if there's anybody there... And his picture is now out on the internet, obviously, because it was there before, but nobody knew who that was. Anyway, it'd be interesting to see if any of those people would recognize Rosicki from that picture, because it would be a, any of his pictures, because it would be a nice little, you know, feather in the, uh, yes, he really was uh, Falcon Cap. But he was apparently in the audience, and um, the people that were represented as Falcon and Condor on the uh, show were... Apparently, like I said, Robert Collins and the other one was Richard Doty, who we can get into if you want, which I'm sure you want. So posing as Falcon was Richard Doty on the show, which has led many people to state over the years that they believe Doty was Falcon. 
every source for that in piece of information is Richard Doty himself, and the people that are saying that say he's a huge liar. And well, I don't, I, I don't know if I disagree with him. But apparently, when he says he's Falcon, they think he's telling the truth. Yeah, there's always that willingness to believe the one thing that you agree with, even though the man has lied about everything else. I don't think he lied about everything else, but if, if you don't know what he's talking about, it's really easy to have him lie. He did it to me when I was working on the Project Beta. He told me a bunch of stories I knew almost for a fact that weren't true, but I just let him go because it, you know, it was interesting and I was talking to Doty. Right. I've talked to people over the course of my life that you know I know they're not telling me the truth, but I just, in fact, if you talk to me after a certain amount of drinks in a bar, some of my old stories might take on a more Balanced. legendary... Yeah, it might be embellished more than they, and I understand why. You know, people like to be the center of attention. So at the end of the day, it all comes back down with Doty, and we won't. I don't want to talk about Doty too much, but I think with Doty, fine. And I have no problem calling these people liars, but in Doty's case, I think it comes down to one of two things: Do you believe he really was more important than some people think he was, and he was involved in all of these things and a top secret agent and blah blah blah, or do you believe that Richard Doty, who really was with AOSI, but was he just kind of making a lot of this up to make himself seem more important than he really was? And, you know, people... I tend to think that, actually. So do I. And I, I just, I don't know how you're ever going to really know for sure. The problem that most people have is like, why do you talk to these people? They lie. Yeah, they do. But they don't lie all the time. And that's the, that's the little game they're playing with you. And if you're interested in that game and think you can get something out of it, sure, listen to their lies. You know, sure, be fooled a whole bunch. But once in a while, something important and useful to you will come out. And that, that's a little game they play. If you don't like the game or you think it's stupid or you think it's dishonest, then stay away from it. But if you think you can get something out of it and you don't let the, these lies and the thing take over your life, then yeah, you might be cut out for trying to figure out what these people are saying and what's useful and what isn't. And th th to me, that's an it that's a, it's an interesting game to me. I like that game. I don't dislike the game. I understand the game. Frankly, anybody who's ever trained to ask questions, you know, whether a lawyer or a police officer or whatever, where yeah. you're going to be confronting people who, by the very nature of the situation, are probably not going to be telling you the truth. Yeah. I.e., a police officer interrogating somebody, which I've done. Yeah. Then you got to look at their motivations too, and what they're what they are talking to you about, and why they would want to talk to you, and what's being revealed, and if they're trying to push you in a direction, etc., etc., etc. Well, the why was we had arrested them, so yeah. <laughs> and it was in Northern Cape Breton, and they were stupid and too dumb to call their lawyers. So chat up, they would. <laughs> but you know, you say, well, great, we'll talk to this person for two hours, and ninety-five percent of what they're going to tell us is our lies. It's yeah. not true. Yeah. Or maybe even 99%. But all you really need is the 1%. And from that 1%, you can extract something and then say, oh, great, back to your cell, you go. And that's not the whole story, but it's the beginning of the real story. Yeah. And from there, you do what police officers are supposed to do, investigate and build a case based on that 1%. Because sooner or later, every liar is going to slip up. And as you say, something's going to come out, even if it's not the truth, it's going to be something that you can probably check if you really want to. And then you can go forward and you could figure out, hey, this guy really is just a liar. So this whole thing is crap. Or, yeah, a lot of that was untrue, but somewhere in there he let slip, whether consciously or subconsciously, just because he was rolling, something that maybe is true. And now I'm going to go follow up on that. People seem to forget that. Like, why do you talk to these lying, you know, lying sacks of shit? Well, that's, that's why. Um, it's, and it's, most people don't have the patience for that. They want the answer. And as yeah. soon as they hear something that they like, that's the answer. Facts be damned. Well, they're not going to get the answer. Um, so anyway, moving on. Jamie Chandray. Did, now, did you ever meet Jamie Chandray? Because he is this mysterious figure. Not in person. I talked to him on the phone for hours for about a period of about 10 or 12 months. And we were in the same city, so I don't know why we never, why we never met up. Bill gave me his number and said... You know, if you want to talk to Jamie, here's his number. I've told him you were going to call, and maybe you can talk to him. And I did. We. T I wish I'd recorded these conversations. They were fun. So what was he like? Because very few, everybody knows Moore. Moore's written books. He's a public figure. You can even find him on the Internet, although it wasn't a long time ago. But Chandra is this mysterious figure that very few people have ever actually met or talked to. 
And frankly, as far as I can tell, nobody really knows where he is now, or if he's even still alive. He's still alive, I believe, last I heard, and he's in the L.A. area, last I heard, but that was, you know, years ago. So I don't know at this point where he is. I'm pretty sure he's still alive. I could probably ask somebody like Walter to find him. He could probably find him in five minutes. So what was Shandere like? How did Moore and Shandere, as John Lennon would say, come together, man? I think it was because Moore was trying to put together a TV show about UFOs, or Shandere was, and they met that way. Shandere was a TV producer. As it turned out, Bill told me, he had been working for some sort of intelligence services back to the Vietnam War off and on. So he had been around the block a bit. Apparently he was called to testify in some court martial case during the Vietnam War because he knew about audio editing and he could hear, you know, edits and things in a transcript. Uh, I mean, not a transcript, in a recording that other people apparently couldn't hear. So they used his expertise in, in like I said, in, a, in some court martial trial where they had to enter as evidence some recordings, I guess. So... You know, he, Jamie knew it, he was had been around intelligence stuff. He had apparently been an asset. I don't think he'd ever been an employee that I know of. I got his number and called him up, and we started talking. And the only thing I remember out of all these conversations and that I've actually written up on UFO Mystic, if people want to look it up, was that he at some point said, I said, you know, what did you find out in all this stuff and all your dealings with Moore and uh, intelligence people? And because he accompanied Moore on a lot of stuff people don't know about. They sneaked onto the Kirtland Air Force Base once, according to instructions given to them in the middle of the night. Uh, they sneaked onto the Air Force Base in a certain area and, start, and looked at some stuff and then left. And apparently the security left them alone because somebody told the security, these guys are going to sneak in, it's just an exercise, leave them alone. And Jamie was one of the people that did that. That is if you believe Bill Moore. But the thing he told me that stuck with me was he said, I know that there's there's uh, intelligences here from another planet, the government knows about it, and I know that for certain. And I, you know, my first question is, like, how can you know that for certain? You know, did you shake hands with some alien being? He said, no. And I said, well, then how can you be so sure? And the thing he said, which is what everybody expected, if you guess it, I'll tell you. So for 10 months, probably I'm like, you know, and I went through everything, you know, first thing you think, films, did you see records? Did you see, but, you know, all this stuff can be faked. I don't know about films at that point, probably, who knows. And he said, no, 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 no. And I never guessed it because it, uh, in December, I think, of 2000, oh, no, it was before that. It was the late 90s because he was. I was going to interview him for the excluded middle. That's what it was. So this was like 98, 99 when I was talking to Jamie. Um, I said, you know, I still hadn't guessed it. And I said, you know, do you want to, uh, can I do an interview with you for the magazine? He said, yeah, sure. I got to go to New York. I'll be back in a couple weeks and we'll do it then. So a couple weeks later, I called his house and it was some other woman answered, some woman answered the phone and. Oh, no, she didn't answer the phone. There was a message that said, if you're looking for somebody named Jamie Shandera or Shandere or something, he doesn't live here, and I don't know why people keep calling asking for him. And this was less than a month after I had talked to Jamie. So, so he got his number changed, and it was reassigned immediately almost, which doesn't happen with, with phone numbers. So somehow his number got changed very quickly. And since then, I never talked to him. He just kind of dropped out. He wouldn't answer his phone. I couldn't get in touch with him. Bill said he didn't know where he was. So that was the end of that. But I never did figure out what he saw, you know, that, that convinced him of this. And in my column at UFO Mystic, I guessed that he'd seen something that actually was talked about on UFO Cover Up Live. So take that for what you, you know, think it's worth. On the show, they said there was some kind of a crystal the aliens gave them. And if you looked into it, you could see, you know, all, you could see all the Earth's history, like a little television screen. Sounds really wacky there ever was such a thing i don't think it was that Who knows what it was it could have been some you know it could have been an ipad way back then but nobody knew, you know knew that's what it was but i thought well maybe he saw that who knows maybe he just couldn't figure out how the thing worked and he just thought well this must be alien technology so i i figured maybe that's what it was but 
I never did find out from him how he could be so sure. And he then he just completely dropped out of the UFO thing, and nobody ever heard from him again. It strikes me that if anybody ever makes the Confessions of a Dangerous Mind version of this film, it won't be more that's the central character. It might be you. You, you might wind up being the central character, surrounded by all these people who may or may not be crazy, may or may not be telling tr the truth, and frankly, may or may not, in my case, even exist. I've got this thing where it's like, I don't think people really care what I think. I'm just going to report what I saw and what happened, and maybe in the midst of that, what I think comes through. But I don't want to say I, me, and all that. I still don't like to do that. But you might be right. Nick, when he wrote about the Collins elite, as it was called, in Final Events, different kind of group of people, but same kind of thing going on for different reasons. People yeah. within the government, within the military establishment in that case, that were interested in the UFO phenomena, uh, phenomenon for their own reasons, and formed this sort of little ad hoc working group, shall we call it, yes. unofficial. So if we have the aviary and we have the Collins elite, Strangely enough, at one point, they were referred to as the Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group. I think that's what they became somehow after the aviary uh, period. Yeah, which is a mouthful, so we'll just call them the aviary. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think there might be more of these groups out there? Does that seem logical to you? Oh, yeah, it's totally logical. Look at the UFO community and all the factions in it. It's just the way humans work. You know, the Collins elite people supposedly were a group that looked at it from basically a fundamentalist Christian perspective. The uh, the aviary was more, I guess, of a humanist or uh, non-denominational perspective, you would think. And there's probably other ones that look at it from, you know, uh, you know, there's scientists that look at it as, as a scientific thing and they're trying to figure it out from that angle. I'm sure there's a lot of these little informal groups around. I talked to this guy, Thomas Dooley who used to work at the um, NSA, National Security Agency, during the Benowitz period, and he said there was a group of people on a, on a mailing list at the Defense Intelligence Agency, and it was informal. Anytime they got any information on UFOs that came in, they would just circulate it to these certain people just because they were interested, informally in the office. Sure, and I think anyone who's ever worked in the civil service, which is what the intelligence community is, whether you're a super duper secret agent or whether you're some low level film agency guy, which is what I was doing here in Canada, the yeah. mechanism is the same. You realize within a larger office or a larger group of people, and I'm just going to use this example, the, take the film agencies across Canada. There's 10 provincial agencies and a federal agency with a lot of people working for them. Not every person who works for all of those agencies is interested in every single thing that goes through those agencies. So what you would do is you would form smaller groups of people. In many cases, add, you just know, hey, there's this guy in Newfoundland, this guy in Ontario, this guy in Manitoba. We're yeah. interested in this. So when something pops up that is that, we'll just email between ourselves or we'll communicate between ourselves because we have an interest even though it's not official it's just something we're interested in so that kind of stuff happens all the time I don't know why that should surprise anybody that would happen within the intelligence communities the mechanisms would be a little more complex because you might be dealing in fact you probably are dealing with secret information so the question is whether how much of it could you release even to people within your own working group but eventually yeah. those kinds of things could be worked out and so you create this unofficial and I think that's the mistake that so many people within the UFO community have made is they view the aviary or even the Collins elite or any of these groups as being official as yeah. being the government is clearly doing this because well wait a second first of all who is the government and secondly no this is just a bunch of guys within the intelligence community who have an interest in the subject and find other people who have an interest in the subject and so they pursue that interest happens all the time yeah all right well we're done then there we've we've solved it <laughs> so if you look at it to finish my thought if you look at it that way it doesn't really matter who falcon was whether it was rosicki or whether it was somebody else because it kind of matters because of the the uh, nature of the intelligence operation supposedly that was going on well it, it would matter perhaps if you're interested in cold war history and if you believe that all of this is true, how the intelligence agencies used many different groups, including ufologists, to mm -hmm. conduct counterintelligence operations against the Soviets or whomever. Okay, well, that's an interesting part of Cold War history, and that's fine. Yeah. Does it matter in terms of trying to figure out what the truth behind the UFO phenomenon actually is? 
and that's kind of what interests me more. I know the Cold War, the Intel stuff interests you. And I would say no. I'm interested it does, in both. It does, well, no, absolutely. I'm just less interested in the Intel thing than you are. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying you're not interested in UFOs. I'm just saying on the UF on purely the UFO stuff, it doesn't it's not terribly relevant. But it's interesting. It's not relevant at all almost. Yeah, okay. Well, you've gone further than I would have because I was trying to be <laughs> I was trying to be polite. But yeah, it doesn't the matter. Only, the only way it's relevant is that um, people have to realize what's going on when something gets released from the government and, and especially to like a couple UFO researchers who are you know in some way probably expected to release the information. There's got to be a reason for that. It may not be to inform the public about the UFO subject. It mirrors the whole X-Files thing with um with X, cigarette smoking man, and that whole idea that the government, elements within the government, again, government in quotation marks, yeah. knows the truth about the alien presence on Earth, and there's a fight within the intelligence community as to whether it should be released or not released, and some people say it should be, so they start releasing it, but can you believe them or not, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. I mean, basically, if you want to find out about this, just watch the X-Files for Pete's sake. <laughs> Now, the only question then is, is the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging the tail in terms of, you know, which came first, the X-Files and then the UF, this this stuff sort of followed that, or was the X-Files an outgrowth of some of these themes that were taking place in the 1980s? And frankly, you can go all the way back to Donald Kehoe and his contacts, you know, with the military and the intelligence communities in the yeah, 50s. Of course. You can't have a podcast without mentioning Donald Kehoe. It's, it's Never. Not, it's not possible. So, but you find these people and they would look and they would say, for instance, NICAP was, it's one of two ways of looking at it. It was infiltrated by the CIA or there were people associated with the CIA who became involved with NICAP. And those are two different ways of looking at it. One implies a purposeful reason for these people joining that has to do with the official government jobs that they hold. To basically to spy on NICAP because they think it's important. And the other involves, hey, there's a couple of guys who happen to be with the CIA, which is a very large organization with many different people with many different interests, and a few of them are actually interested in UFOs. So they decide to join the organization, the, the most prominent organization that is looking into the UFO question. Does that really, would that really come as a surprise to anyone? I actually find that more likely than the idea that the CIA was spying on NICAP to discover what it knew about UFOs. I think there's a little bit of both going on, but I'm kind of up in the air about whether the CIA or whoever it was broke up NICAP. I mean, there's plenty of internal dissension in, in uh, all kinds of UFO organizations that break them up. I'm sure there's people like, uh, I don't know, maybe even Richard Dolan who would say that, yes, there are P P Peter Robbins would say definitely there were people in NICAP that were there to break it up to you know keep the UFO secret. That the government knew. I, I'm not so sure about that, but I'm, I'm not going to sit here and you know give a litany of, of evidence because I wouldn't know what it was at this point. I think it's probably a combination of you know internal BS, and I think they they probably were channeling some of the information NICAP was getting because they they probably they might have had a better information network than the government did at that point. Yeah, maybe. Although I have a higher regard for the government's ability to call information out of multiple sources. Uh, right. Well, okay. Then it was an a it was an asset to the rest of their sources. Like, well, here's another source of UFO information. Sure, I I could even go with that. Although I think it's more likely these were people working unofficially. But even if they were working officially, I don't think that they were in the game to break up NICAP or APRO or any of these organizations. Because frankly, these organizations break themselves up eventually. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like it's like I that that quote in the book. Uh, UFO researchers are perfectly capable of disinforming themselves. Yes, they do it all the time. So we've now discovered who Falcon is. Maybe. Maybe. Did any of the other members of the aviary, to your knowledge, either know who he was or ever meet him or interact with him? Was he an actual functioning part of the aviary? So if I went to Bruce McAbee, and assuming Bruce was going to tell me the truth about everything, or if I went to Hal Putoff, would they say, oh, of course, yeah, that's the guy. I knew who Falcon was because I dealt with him. No, they wouldn't say that. In fact, I was sitting in Bill Moore's office one time when he got an email from from uh, Hal Putoff essentially saying, could you please tell us who Falcon was? So they didn't know who Falcon was. Okay. Not all of them. There might have been a couple that knew because I think he showed it up at a couple of meetings. Um, 
people didn't say, hi, this is the Falcon guy that runs everything. No, he was just he was just the meeting and basically listened and told people that needed to do what they needed to do, what they needed to do. I have this picture in my mind of all these people sitting around in bird costumes around <laughs> a circular table like the Justice League or, you know, the Knights of King Arthur and um, and poor Bruce McAbee dressed like a seagull. Yeah, well, who, I, I, you would hope so. I've, I'm afraid it was far less interesting than that. Although one time, it, it, Bill told me about this, and a couple other people brought this up too. They had a meeting in the middle of a lake somewhere in the northern Midwest, like at a picnic table under a little little awning in the middle of a lake. They all had to take little row, I mean, uh, motorboats out there because they didn't want anybody listening. Why not? Frankly, if I was doing something like this, even kind of just as an interest, I'd have a little fun with it. So I'd say, yeah, let's meet in the middle of a lake like Bond villains. Yeah. Or, you know, the Legion of Doom or something like that. Well, Bill did wait till there was almost no chance of anybody overhearing us before he told me. And then he said, and then I said, what do I do with this information? He goes, do what you want with it. Um, I actually emailed people like put off and a couple others i emailed them pictures of rosicki and i said do you know who this is because i was i didn't want to say i found out it was rosicki what do you think i just wanted to get their opinion and to, you know either they either didn't respond or like put off did it's like i don't know that he said i don't know who that is it could be anybody and that was the extent of his response he didn't say well who do you think it is you know could you tell me he just said i don't know who that is could be anybody that was it is this the moment when we should reveal all the members of the cabal? No, nah, we'll, we'll do that some other time. No, some other time. We have our own secret group. And yeah, and if you guess it, we'll tell you you're right. Exactly. And it's not just Nick and Greg and Mac and I. There are other members, secret members. Yeah. See, yeah. How, see how easy it is and kind of how fun? Because yeah. there'll probably be one out of the 74 people who listen to this who go, hey, wait a second now, I've always suspected. Kimball's close to flock. <laughs> we'll call ourselves a flock of seagulls. We were we were inspired by Bruce McAbee, so we we named our cabal the Flock of Seagulls, and it's flock. I, yeah, at some point I should have Bruce on my show. He said he would do it. Yeah, Bruce is an interesting cat. Um, cat. Yeah, he's a cat, man. He's a jazz cat. He is a jazz cat. He's a great jazz. Plays great, very nice piano. A lot of UFO people are very creative people. Jerry Clark, you know, a very good songwriter. I get down the list. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Maccabee's a crazy cat. I like him. So, folks, we've our takeaway from this is Harry Rosicki may have been Falcon. Um, Bruce Maccabee's a cool guy with a lot of interests. Um, what else do we have? I think that's about it. As usual with these shows, Greg, they just kind of implode and peter yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, folks, thanks for tuning in. For anyone who's still listening to another episode of The Other Side, we should do like the paracasting where I say The Other Side and then you go, The Truth. Of oh, Truth. Oh, yeah, right. No, you know the name better than I do. All right, let's, yeah. let's try that. I'll go The Other Side of and then you just go Truth. Let's okay. see if that works. All right, three, two, one. The Other Side of Truth. Oh, that's not bad. In fact, I think that's better than the paracast. So, yeah, thanks for listening, folks. Uh, the over-under on Donald Kehoe, I think, was 44 minutes, so I think we're over on that for any of you in Vegas that were betting on that tonight. And, um, yeah, it's interesting, as always, talking to Greg about this crazy kind of confluence of events between the intelligence communities and the UFO subject and whether there's actually anything there. And even if there isn't, it's a fun story. And why wouldn't you want to be listening to something about that? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> one of the few shows where I can just say whatever the hell I want and not be too worried about the consequences, except later when you're editing it and crack up and make me say something that I didn't actually say through the magic of your editing. So go right ahead. I used to tell kids in, when I teach the high school classes in documentary filmmaking, two phrases for you, kids. I like ice cream. I hate Hitler. Now, all you need to know about documentary filmmaking from the Michael Moore School of Documentary <laughs> Filmmaking <laughs> is you take those two quotes from the same person said at different times, splice them together, and the next thing you know, he hates ice cream and he likes Hitler. Boom. Which is probably going to be the title of this episode. I like Hitler. I hate ice cream. <laughs> with, Greg, with Greg Bishop. What? People are like, what? Oh, what kind of crazy episode is that? Oh. Well, if you say if you call it that, you'll get a shitload more listeners. <laughs> I certainly will, including some people from Homeland Security, I suspect. So, <laughs> wait a minute, Hitler came through. What's going on here? Um, anyway, thanks very much. As always, a lot of fun talking to my friend Greg Bishop and you folks out there who are listening to this. You can decide for yourself whether there's any truth to this other side of the story. 
a falcon in the aviary.